Hi everybody and welcome to another piano comparison here on the Miriam Pianos YouTube channel. My name is Stu Harrison and if you haven't guessed it by now, today's video is going to be all about the ES120 versus Yamaha's newest version of their P125, the P125A. Both are sitting here brand new in box ready to get unboxed and we're going to be comparing the sound, the action, the features, letting you hear all of that stuff straight out of the line outs. We're very excited to do this comparison. If it's the first time that you've seen us here on YouTube, we would really, really appreciate it if you hit that subscribe and the notification bell. Without further ado, let's get to the unboxing of the ES120 and the P125A right away. So we're gonna start with the ES120. This, of course, is the replacement to the ES110. The ES110 got a lot of praise out there. There were channels calling this like the best value instrument for under $1,000 on the market. Uh, we were certainly big fans of that instrument. And I was interested to see what Kawhi was gonna do with the ES120 to follow that up. Uh, it's a very different strategy to what Yamaha has taken with the P125A, which we're going to get to uh, shortly. But in short, rather than essentially just try and strip the ES110 back into something that was packaged as a newer item, but uh, kind of keeping the same price, which we know inflation's been a thing. So keeping the same price basically means that you're finding things to strip out of the instrument. They have um, made a few improvements to what the ES110 was. Uh, and I, I wouldn't say any of them are actually like super significant improvements, but they are improvements. And it's nice always when you're going to have to pay more for something that is undoubtedly going to cost Kawhi more to build in 2022 than it did in 2018 to feel like you're getting something extra for that money other than just simply keeping up with inflation. And in the 120s case, that is an improved action. So this is still the responsive hammer compact. It's not the responsive hammer compact two. There was some ambiguity with that uh, at the time of release. And I think we even put a video out, I think mislabeling that action coming up as responsive hammer compact too. It is just the original, but it's the improved version, which means that there is a slightly redesigned geometry. And the biggest thing uh, is improved padding on both the down and the upstroke to reduce the mechanical sound of that action. The other improvements have been the addition of Bluetooth audio. That is not something that the ES110 had. It had Bluetooth MIDI, uh, but not Bluetooth audio. So that gives people the ability to stream uh, audio sources over Bluetooth to these speakers. Nothing can leave via Bluetooth. For those getting excited about buying Bluetooth uh, headphones for this, uh, hold your horses. It's only to stream from your mobile device onto this. The other thing that has received some improvement uh, is their uh, reverb and signal processing engine. Uh, it seems like that's something that's trickling through all of Kawhi's newest models uh, this year. Uh, we're seeing it on the CN201, the CN301. Uh, I have yet to play a CN or a CA901 or 701, but my understanding is the same tech uh, got into there. So just better, um, yeah, better quality reverb and some of that spatialization technology. Uh, making its way uh, in there. And uh, other than that, uh, the the visual difference is that we've got a, a pretty nicely redesigned uh, cabinet for the ES120. It really feels up to date. They've taken some, um, some very nice modern design cues from a few other uh, industries and incorporated it into here. Uh, we also have uh, some more functional tone ports in the top of the ES120, so you're getting some of that reflection off the back of the speaker boxes. There are no upward facing speakers there, but they are just tone ports so that you do get a little bit better treble presentation up on top of the piano. So those are really the fundamental differences of what you're getting uh, with the ES120. I know there were some people sad to see the five pin DIN MIDI uh, go, um, I know that there's some people who are in studio setups where that's still kind of the prevailing method of connectivity. I would say for the most part though, people have switched over to USB, so I don't think there's going to be really a, a big um, sort of outcry over the missing five pin uh, DIN. The other thing that is missing is the ES110 used to come with a big, fat, expensive 
super high quality sustain pedal. I'm I'm pretty bummed that we're we're now down to the piece of plastic. But I suppose in Kawhi's defense, I don't think there's any other manufacturer uh, who puts out a 88 note stage piano in this price point that includes one. So I think they were the outliers and that was the one spot they were like, okay, yeah, we can trim back on that. Uh, and they obviously did. Anyway, let's get right to hearing and playing the ES120. Uh, the two big sample sets on here are the SKEX and the EX. I'm gonna say even before we start playing, I'm gonna be starting on the SKEX and shifting to the EX, um, but when I'm playing through headphones, I much prefer the SKEX. When I'm playing through the onboard speakers, I actually prefer the EX because it's got uh, just naturally a slightly brighter sound. And I find that the speakers on here, much like a lot of the Rollins in this um, range, like FP10, FP30X, uh, tend to have a, a nice warm mid-range tone, but sometimes you're missing a little bit of that clarity. So going with the EX uh, just, um, I, I think, gives a bit of a better balanced sound. You could probably also achieve that by doing some tweaking uh, with their virtual technician uh, app um, and, and just brightening up the SKEX anyway. So you can do either. Anyway, like I said, we're going to start with the SKEX. Here it is. That's the X, that's the SKEX. Now let's hear the EX.
almost got into somewhere from West Side Story there. So those are the two big samples on this instrument, the SKEX and the EX. Let's now uh, continue to listen through to a few more. Sounds like that could be an upright sample. Sounds like we're back to the top. Yeah, it's so crazy when you get all the way up to the top of that list and then you hit back to the SKEX, like just the space that you hear uh, in that sample compared to some of the more compressed, you know, less focused on samples is just crazy. The typical uh, e-pianos are also here. Yeah.
Oh, I can feel a pipe organ coming on here. Uh, and then like a pipe horn, like a flute, like a f eight foot flute or something like that. And then back to the top. All in all, I think there's 25 tones on here, but the vast majority are in the piano and the E piano. The others are gonna have like probably Kawhi stock string sounds. Although that sounds vastly improved. I mean, I've been dumping on Kawhi's basic sounds outside of their acoustic and e-pianos for like a long time. Back to strings. So that's the entire complement of the ES120. Gonna be honest, I figured that we were gonna see maybe some updates to just uh, kind of the, uh, the the DSP stuff, uh, maybe some of the, the, the reverb engine, but there's something about that string. That does not sound like the same one that was on the ES110. That's like way more lush and and modern and not sounding at all like a downgrade from where the piano is. That's That was a little surprising. Anyway, all of that is coming to you uh, with 192 notes worth of maximum polyphony, uh, and we've got it coming straight out to you out of quarter inch line outs, um, but the onboard speakers are a pair of 10 watt rated speakers, and those are uh, speaker boxes that are downward facing, but as I said, uh, there's some kind of this tone port up top. Um, that does, I mean, maybe that's the difference. Maybe that's what I'm hearing with the strings, but I don't think so. I think there's something else going on there. And that's pretty much all she wrote when it comes to the sound on the ES120. So we're gonna move over to the Yamaha now and have a listen to its core tones and talk about some of the things that we are noticing. So the 125A is an update to the original 125. Um, I believe the official release of the 125A was uh, somewhere later 2021 started kind of trickling into various stores and getting reviewed uh, kind of mid 2022. This is my first chance to actually be in front of a P125A. Um, and I've been digging through the forums, looking at uh, all of the changes and uh, getting acquainted uh, with what I thought I was gonna be expecting. Um, but I will say, generally speaking, uh, that I've enjoyed the playing experience. The 125, uh, there was always a couple of nice things that I liked about the 125, and I've spoken about this in other videos. I really like the fact that for something at this price point, they've got upward facing speakers, and so for people who are gonna be using this primarily without headphones, that's a really nice feature, and it's somewhat unusual. You know, you have the Casios in this range which have rear facing speakers, so they're trying to split the difference between getting some, some nice uh, kind of lower resonance that you get normally when you've got downward facing speakers, uh, but still get some 
some uh, some uh, some clarity uh, up front for the player. Kawhi and Roland generally both just have uh, downward facing speakers uh, in this price range. So the 125 kind of stood out to me as as uh, being. Uh, yeah, kind of a leader of the pack when it came to the speaker configuration or the or the quality, the sound. Certainly, when I was comparing it last to instruments such as the FP30 uh, or the ES110. Now, depending on what website you're on and what spec sheet you read, it's a little tricky. You kind of have to be reading the tea leaves to really uh, discern what they've changed about the 125A. Uh, over the 125. Playing this instrument, I don't think there's really anything that's different about the tone engine over the 125, so I think it's still using the uh, pure uh, CF3 uh, tone engine. I don't think the speaker configuration or the wattage uh, that it's rated at, which is seven watts per side, but then you've got like the little tweeters up front and the uh, downward facing speakers uh, built in, I don't think that's changed. The number of sounds available hasn't changed, but there are two things that, that are a little bit different. I don't know if the GHS action has been slightly tweaked over prior GHS, GHS actions, um, but uh, I will say that this GHS action feels like it's been slightly reconfigured from a weighted standpoint. I don't know if that's true. I don't know if anybody else has had that impression. They still have the high gloss uh, white key covers, which I'm really not a fan. Um, and there is not a lot of lateral give, which still makes me think uh, that this is once it starts to loosen up, as all plastic actions do, we might uh, you know, get into some uh, clickiness. That's been my past experience on GHS, but this does feel better than past GHS actions that I've played. So take that for whatever it's worth. There's a few other non-musical features that have been changed on the 125A, but we're gonna get into that when, when we move on to the feature section and we're comparing both of them. Right now, let's just listen to the 125A and we're gonna start at the main piano tone and just work our way through just as we did with the ES120. And then the second uh, acoustic piano sound. Then we get into the E pianos.
like that patch. And then into organs. That's a nice sample. Always has been. And then we get into vibes and clav. Clav. And then into strings. Yeah, on the original 125, those strings were always so much better than what was on the ES-110. I, you know... They're a little bit different, but it's it's way more of a horse race now. to bass. So that is the entire gamut of the sound selection on the 125A. It also has 192 notes worth of maximum polyphony coming at you. Now, in terms of comparing some of those tones, um, this is my, these are my general observations, uh, is that there's a few key uh, tones on the ES120 that just sound fatter, that just sound thicker. Uh, and to be fair, I mean, this is a much newer release. The 125A is, seems kind of like a warmed over um, sort of redo of just the original, whereas I think the 120, uh, there's a lot more fundamental um, circuitry changes that have been made, uh, same kind of thing that you're seeing across the 201 and the 301. The reverb engine being a little bit upgraded, uh, which is going to obviously affect just the whole fidelity of the entire experience because most of the time you are playing with some type of reverb. So that's almost like a permanent filter uh, on the sound. Um, but I think there's some other samples that have just straight up been upgraded as well. Uh, so acoustic piano wise, when I'm listening through headphones, that SKEX just cannot uh, be beat in my opinion. It's not that I don't enjoy the Yamaha, it's just when you have them side by side, uh, the depth of the tone and the, and the just dynamicism of the tone between the two uh, is, is fairly obvious I would say to, to anybody who is just listening to it objectively. So here it is side by side. Here's the piano uh, one or the primary piano on the Yamaha. And 
And then here is the Kauai. Uh, another one I noticed was just felt like it had a little more depth and a little more shape to it was the primary E piano as well. Over to the 125. But then when it comes to a lot of the organ sounds, uh, the the vibes, the clav, I, you know, there are slight differences, but I don't really think they fall into like a quality difference. It's more just, you know, personal preference. Um, the string sounds, again, whereas, you know, I used to think that most of the Kawhi products with their uh, strings in this type of price range was kind of an afterthought. It was there to, um, you know, be able to provide a string type experience, but it wasn't necessarily class leading uh, by any means. This is a really, really nice string sound and it certainly brings it into the same class of the strings that's on the, on the Yamaha. Slightly different behaviors in terms of the attack, like the envelope on it. Um, the Yamaha has a few different options in terms of a slightly delayed attack. Um, uh, Kawhi has sort of the same. Uh, I think they've got two strings options uh, versus uh, the Yamaha that really has three string options. We're gonna move on to a discussion about the action now. And thank you so, so much for being with us. This is really an enjoyable comparison for me. Hope you're enjoying it too. See you in a minute. Anybody who follows Yamaha products is gonna know that while they make good product, they don't often like to disclose very many technical details about what they're doing. They tend to keep their cards pretty close to their chest. They like to uh, speak more in generalized language and every once in a while where it's a very, very clear differentiator, they'll come right out and say it. But when it comes to some of the more subtle details of the products they do, they kind of leave a lot of that up to the imagination. This is where I think maybe the GHS action has uh, been improved. Both of these um, actions are a lot quieter than previous versions of either one of these that I've played. So maybe what it is that I'm feeling or noticing on the GHS um, is that the cushioning has been improved on the GHS uh, on this version. Anybody who's got some inside knowledge from Yamaha and wants to contribute that on uh, the, the comments, I'd love to hear, but uh, this is just sort of raw, unfiltered speculation on my part. There's something about that GHS that's just feeling a little bit different than prior GHSs that I've played. I'm guessing the Yamaha made a few tweaks to it, um, albeit maybe subtle, and it just didn't announce it, didn't talk about what it was, retained that GHS uh, branding around the action. Could be. I know Kawhi has been a lot more uh, vocal about the fact that this is exactly what it was that they improved on uh, the RHC. Uh, they did the same thing on the RHC2 and the RH3 for people who sort of follow uh, Kawhi Land. Those are kind of the three plastic actions that they have out there in the universe. RHC being the most basic, that's what's on here. Dual sensor, same as the GHS. No escapement, same as the GHS. So really when it comes down to the differences between these two actions, uh, one of the biggest, which is not usually something I make a big deal of, but Otherwise, these are relatively so close in terms of spec. It's the key surface. Kawhi's got a matted key surface uh, on its white key, whereas the GHS, unfortunately, still seems to be using um, a bit of a pet peeve of mine, which is like, it's a very, very shiny plastic, which is super grippy. So for some people who have very dry hands, this is like a non-issue. I don't have very wet or dry hands. I feel like they're kind of just in the middle, but when I'm Playing on the Yamaha, it's, it's definitely got a little more grip than I would prefer. 
I know other people where this is like a non-issue, uh, but I do know one thing for sure is that almost all manufacturers, once you start going up in price point, add texture to their key, and uh, regardless of brand, there's a much better balance between uh, you know, your ability to glide across the key and grip. So this is not a brand specific thing. The whole industry moves in that direction at some point when you start going up. So I think there seems to be agreement that super grippy isn't necessarily the best thing. But this is what they've got on the GHS. Now the black keys on the other hand are like a matte uh, on the Yamaha. They're also a matte on the Kawai. Anyway, those are my observations on the action. We're gonna have to be back for one last quick section where we're gonna be talking about the features. So let's start with the first biggest difference. There is a price difference between these two instruments and it's not like 25 or 50 bucks. Uh, the Kawai is sitting at a couple of hundred dollars above where the Yamaha sits. Um, originally, uh, the ES-110 was slightly more expensive than the P125. The ES-120 is now sitting um, like meaningfully more expensive than the P125. So what is going on here? Uh, well, there is some shrinkflation going on in some respects uh, with the P125. Um, because from a component standpoint, they have actually stripped something away. And I have to assume that this is because Yamaha felt it was more important to maintain a strong presence with, you know, one of the world's most popular musical products, the P125, without really shifting the price point that dramatically. What have they taken away? Well, they have taken out the USB audio interface, which honestly was one of the coolest things about the original P125. Um, I don't know what percentage of customers were using that as a feature, um, but Yamaha obviously uh, dug in and realized that there must have been enough who weren't uh, to feel like this wasn't going to be a risk uh, in removing that feature. So there is no ability to record USB audio either onto a USB audio key or to connect it through a USB uh, cable to your computer um, and have this essentially be your audio interface. You could do that with the original 125. Over here on the Kawai, this now has Bluetooth audio, which is a really uh, nice feature to have. And it's now compatible with all of Kawai's latest apps. Besides that, Yamaha still has one advantage that Kawai uh, doesn't, which is it's got those onboard uh, rhythms and auto accompaniment, which I've demoed before. The quality of those is actually quite good. It, it, it's pretty in line with what you get on the Roland app that you can use with like say the FP30 or the FP60, um, but of course you need the app. It's right on board here uh, with the Yamaha P125 uh, and you can get to it very easily uh, with just the rhythm key. Um, besides that, the overall look of the instruments, you can tell that the 125 is getting a little bit dated. It's not that it looks bad, it's not that the interface is any less usable than it was before, it's just the aesthetic changes from year to year, and this definitely feels like something that's come out in 2022, whereas this is feeling so, uh, like something more in the like 2015, 2016 range. Some of the Casio products uh, that have been out for a little while suffer from the same thing. You can see that on like, uh, like the PX860 is feeling, uh, you know, a little bit dated at this point where some of the other ones are, uh, you know, subtle cues that the design has been updated, particularly with the most recent PXS series. Both of these instruments uh, come with available matching stands. Uh, you can get triple pedals also uh, with both of them, and they come in a couple of different colors. I believe the 125A you can get in black and white. Uh, the ES120 comes in black, white, and this really cool light gray, which is Pretty styling. I saw a couple of shots of it. It almost looked like there was a tinge of like champagne in it, like a little bit of a gold, uh, and it was very, very attractive. So let's get to some conclusions here. Both of these instruments are incredibly solid in their own right. Uh, given that Yamaha really hasn't budged much off its price point, you have to uh, give them kudos uh, for still what is a very, very high value product. Uh, on the other hand, Kawhi. Uh, has you know made some incremental improvements to the 110. Uh, it looks a heck of a lot better. The navigation is way easier than what was on the ES110. They've added the Bluetooth audio, uh, and there's definitely some increase in the fidelity of the tone uh, coming out. So we've lost a little bit here to keep the price point. We've gained uh, several little bits. 
uh, and really just had inflation kind of kick in for where they've priced uh, the ES110. And of course, at this point, they're both coming default just with those uh, little pedals. I think for people who are super focused on having um, a really nice, lush, uh, complex piano tone, they're going to gravitate towards the ES120 if it's between these two. Uh, the CF3, um, you know, sampling on that uh, sounds good, but it's just a little, uh, a, it's, it's very clean and it's just lacking some of the depth that you get out of the sample over there. But other than that, it's still a really good playing experience if you're looking for just a nice all-rounder that gives you a little bit of rhythm, a nice selection of tone, and you want to keep it under that $1,000 range. For people who can go up a little bit more, and as I said, the focus is going to be uh, kind of more on the acoustic piano playing experience, and particularly if you're going to be using this sort of a mix between headphones and not, uh, man, that SKEX sample set with this improved, uh, some of those improved DSP things, really, really hard to beat. Hope you have enjoyed uh, this review. It's been a tremendous uh, fun to make for me for sure. If it's the first time that you've checked us out here on the channel, we'd really appreciate you hitting that subscribe and notification bell. And let us know if you found the video helpful. Uh, the whole idea here is to try and increase your knowledge so you can make a great choice. Really would love to know which one you ultimately wind up going with. And check the description for links uh, where you can check out where to purchase either one of these uh, all around the world. My name is Stu Harrison. We'll see you soon.